Hello, ho, 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 and wow, welcome nice. into Gorilla Hockey with JJ and Jesse. I'm in the Christmas spirit. Yeah. I wore my Christmas sweater one episode too early, I guess. I didn't want to rehash yeah. it. Yeah, Plus, I don't right. even think I've washed it yet, but Jesse's rocking the Santa hat. See, I love well, it. Well, see, it, it works, though, because you were Christmas up, Christmas up last episode, and I missed the memo. And now I've got it, and so it, it balances out. If we'll just we'll just like edit the two shows together, the conversation won't make any sense, but <laughs> it'll visually it'll be very cohesive. Don't forget those Coach Prime glasses I yeah. had. Those were those. Were I was sweet. hoping you'd bring them back actually again. Uh, I'll bring them back at one point, especially now. This is what I was hoping for. We've got the the bright lights today. Last yeah. week we didn't have them. I wanted the the gold of the glasses to really be shining. Pop. We didn't get them to pop as much. But uh, how are you? Are you in the Christmas spirit, Jesse? It's sneaking up on us <laughs> real quick. The Dude, weather, yeah. sunny all the time, isn't helping. Yeah, but I do. Th- I believe I saw that we are supposed to have uh, some some white. Uh, at least hours between Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. I don't fully know if it'll be a white Christmas, but uh, you know, man, this has been a a weird holiday season uh, for me, and I really feel like for us in general, because the Avs, I was just talking about this uh, with the Avs head of PR out in Chicago. Man, it feels like this has been a crazy busy schedule to start the season. Um, back to back every night, you know, for me, I've, I've been on the road a lot. So it's been hard for me to like settle into the Christmas spirit, uh, but actually in Chicago, uh, when the game was back here on Sunday, I had... A little bit of time to go out. I went out into Chicago, did some Christmas shopping. You know, there was lots of Christmas music playing, Christmas lights, lots of trees. And it hit you. It, it helped, right? It helped get me in the in the um, spirit a bit. I think I need to get through tomorrow night's game. Yeah, we still got one game to go before right. we're fully into the little Christmas break. But, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. And, and the December schedule was – it was hectic, right? Yeah. We had the five-game homestand, which I'm not going to lie, it kicked my ass a little bit, a lot of eight – PM starts, uh, mm-hmm. which are kind of dwindling through the rest of the season. We'll have a lot more consistent 7 PM starts at home, which will be great. But yeah, I'm with you. It's it's been it's been hectic. Seems more so than past seasons for sure. Yeah, yeah, and I and I do know that part of that is they've had the Finland trips scheduled both of the last two seasons. Obviously, they only did it last year. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> so that contributes to it. But but again, I and I, and. Truthfully, I haven't dug into it super hard to, you know, actually know. Um, but yeah, it just it feels like we got into the, you know, every other night really quickly, and and it's just kind of been hard to focus on the holiday season. Um, but I, you know, man, growing up, I, I, I always loved this time of year. Uh, just you know, there's just some extra cheerfulness typically, you know, in the air. I'm one of the I I I, I think it's fun to go to the mall this time of year. I agree. Um, you know, and it's alive and well. I was at the mall the other day. I've been at the mall a couple times recently, and yeah. it it's good to see that people are still going to the mall. Right? There was yes. a, I think, a stretch where everybody was really into online shopping and just bailed on the mall altogether. Mm-hmm. The mall showing some life because online shopping is hit or miss, right? Sometimes yeah. you get exactly what you want. Sometimes you're like, well, this is four sizes too big. How did <laughs> this happen? Well, it it almost kind of reminds me of like the streaming trend, where like five years ago, everyone was like. Oh, ditching cable completely. And I'm going to get 15 different streaming services. And now, like, you've kind of seen this middle ground pendulum kind of swing back and be like, well, all right, I guess I'll t- feel like it's the same with online shopping. Like, yeah, that was cool, but eight of the nine things I ordered weren't exactly what I thought they'd be. So I'll just go pick it up. Indeed. And I still am a hold it in my hands kind of guy before I buy it. Yeah, it's so much better. You actually can get a feel for the quality, get an idea of exactly what you're buying rather than being like, hopefully this is yeah, this what looks, the picture showed. Right, this looks cool online. Yeah. Right, right. Well, I think somebody who maybe isn't so much in the Christmas <laughs> spirit was Devon Taves since our last podcast. Of course, yeah. Gorilla Sports video going viral of Devon Taves just ripping into his teammates, mm-hmm. more or less, um, being a little grinchy. <laughs> um. You know, man, that was a – you and I talk about it a lot. Going into those locker rooms after losses is not fun. Uh, Of all the really cool things that we do get to do as part of this job, walking into a losing locker room is not one of them. Uh, And then especially after a loss like that, right, where, uh, you know, you you lose to bad teams every now and then. 
if you're a Stanley Cup contender, you shouldn't. Well, and that's, I think, kind of maybe what broke the camel's back there was they've lost to a lot of bad teams this year. It's mm. been a couple times where you're like, what? They have no business losing to this team. Mm. And that's exactly what it was for Chicago, right? You even had the, the pregame video of Connor Bedard going into that Chicago matchup. And his words, he was basically like, oh, man, they are so good. Like, I don't even know if we have the personnel to keep up with this mm-hmm. team. And that's where I'm like, oh. Av's got this one. Well, well and, and I do feel like there's been a couple of those games, like what you're talking about, where they've lost to maybe teams they should have beat. But I, I feel like there's always been something, that, you know, ah, goaltender got really hot. The, you know, the game against the Blues where they got blown out. D- two hat tricks. <clears throat> it's like, ah, kind of anomalous things happen. You can kind of write it off. That Blackhawks game was like, no, you just did not play well. You didn't play well. You could tell by the way that Ryan Donato reacted to that first goal, how, like, fired up he was, that, like, even the Hawks knew we have no business in this game. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't win this game. And <clears throat> that that was, you know, so that makes it even worse. Um, and then, you know, man, the so the comments that Devon Taves makes, um, obviously very pointed, very kind of, yeah, like you said, grinchy. I noticed a little bit of a theme, though. Going all the way back to the 7 nothing loss in Vegas. Okay. There are three separate instances of Nathan McKinnon, Jared Bednar, and now Devon Taves. Not, not saying the exact same thing, but the themes are all the same. Guys aren't buying in yet. You know, Nathan McKinnon talked about lack of chemistry. Lack of chemistry on the ice. Jared Bednar said verbatim, we're still working on getting some of the new guys bought in. He said it's getting there. It's getting there. Not quite there yet. And now Devon Taves a couple nights ago says, there's guys who think they're playing well, and I think they're kidding themselves at this point. And then he goes on to talk about, not that they're bad hockey players, but they're not playing within the system. And the system says, go left, and they're going right and saying, ah, I think it's better to go right. No, the system says go left because there's someone backing you up on the right. And obviously that's a very vague example. But, like, I put those three things together over a little bit more than a month, you know, probably about a month and a half, and you piece those three bits together, and it's like there's a problem that's not being solved here. And clearly a 3-2 loss against Chicago got that frustration to boil up to the point where Devon Taves – you know, comes out and said that I, you know, you know that they're, you know, he's not saying that just to the media, mm-hmm. but like for a guy like Taves to say that to the media, that tells me that the frustration got to a, a, a level that he felt like, cool, you're not going to listen when we say it in here. I'll say it to them. Yeah. I think having it come from Devon Taves was interesting for a couple reasons for me one of which is typically he's just such a mild-mannered even keel type of fellow right and I don't even know if hockey is necessarily you know the end-all be-all for him like I don't know if he has that full-on passion that maybe most hockey nerds and hockey lovers have right <clears throat> I, I will never forget the conversation I had with him earlier this year asking him about his hockey stick and saying, "Hey, are you gonna upgrade to the newer version?" And he looks at me like, "What, what are you, what, what are you talking about now?" Mm-hmm. I was like, "Oh no, your stick." <laughs> He's like, "Oh yeah, I don't, I don't really care." <laughs> um, so I thought that it's interesting that he had such, I guess, feelings about what was going on. See, go ahead. Secondly, I think he's been part of the problem. I look back at that five-game home stretch, and I remember specifically there were moments where I'm watching Devon Taves turn over the puck and saying Devon Taves does not look like himself right now. So, two things: one, I don't nec- I don't necessarily disagree with the first part of what you're saying. I had there's two separate people in my mentions of that video that were Islanders fans that, and I'd have to go back and pull it up. And I apologize, bad show prep. I didn't I didn't think about to go pull this up. There were two separate people that mentioned that there was some interview that was done about when he was in Long Island, other players talking about how intense he was. And there was actually even a player that compared him to Michael Jordan after the last dance thing came out, that he's that level of intense Hmm. with expectations. And I will also say, I've liked talking to him this year because he, I feel like he gives me very honest feedback. He's kind of like Nate in that, 
I feel like I get a good pulse of the team when I talk to Devon Taves. Um, and then second, th- this is the part I want to clarify. Th- th- and I guess I shouldn't say clarify. My take on what he was saying. I don't think he was even saying these are players that are that are playing poorly. I think what he I do think that he meant systematically because I he had he knows he hasn't been perfect this year. He hasn't looked quite as good as he has the last couple of years. But I, I I think his point is so you go back and rewatch those three goals against Chicago. The, the third one is just a really weird bad breakdown on behalf of the entire penalty kill. You end up with two guys behind you below the dots. That's typically not great. But you go watch those first two goals, dude. There are bad systematic breakdowns. And you can tell that there's guys who are jumping in and pinching, thinking that they've got someone backing them up and there's nobody there. So I, I, while I I don't disagree with you that I don't think Devon Taves' play has been maybe to the level that we expect, what I think he's more of talking about isn't this guy's playing well, this guy isn't. It's they're not doing what they're supposed to do and it's leading to bad breakdowns and it's leading to you know cheap turnovers, you know, horrible scoring chances against two on ones because you know you know F3 isn't coming back and filling no, in and, with a deep pinch or I whatever thought, it is. I thought about that, right? Like I I, I picture okay, Devontae's has his head up during an outlet pass and the forward that he was expecting to be here is not there and mm-hmm. so suddenly he has to do something completely different with the puck and that's where these turnovers are, are yep. coming. But I still see a little you know some bobbled puck and he's totally. not the only one. Totally. He's definitely not the only one. There was one game during that five game home stretch, I forget which one it was, but I remember sitting there like I've never seen so many bobbled pucks and fanned yeah. passes and fanned shots in one single sitting, and it, it was just that kind of night for the Avalanche that night. Let me let me just real quick, because it's it's something that sticks out to me. I remember when the Avs traded for Josh Manson two seasons ago now, which is crazy. I believe it was his. It, it was definitely his first home game. It may have been his first game with the Avs, but I remember we talked to him that morning, and he said, like, yeah, it'll take a little bit to get used to the systems, and he said it's very different. It's very different than what I was doing. And that night, he got the puck and he skated up the middle of the ice and he like stopped, did a full, like, you know, he's righty, so he curled to his left, curled all the way around and threw it to a point on the blue line, you know, breaking out of the zone. And there was nobody for like 30 feet. And I remember, I think it was even you and I laughed and we were like, yep, that's one of those moments where in his old system, someone was standing there and now no one's there. And it led to this really bad turnover. I think that's what you've got a lot of. And I think your point about Taves where, you know, because he said that it's hard to play when you don't know where Mm -hmm. guys are going to be. I think that is contributing to not just Taves, but a lot of these really bad turnovers we've been seeing from the Avs this season is, all right, perfect, picking the puck up. I know if I make this outlet here, I get it back there. And I know there's a guy here. They get it back and they're looking up and it's just open ice. Along with what you were saying of like what we're hearing routinely from a couple guys. We've heard so much about how they're giving up grade A chances, right? Mm. And I heard Jared Bednar the next morning after the the Devontae's video on the radio doing his weekly radio interview. And that's kind of, what, kind of what he got into again. He's like, we can play really well for eight minutes. We don't score. We have one bad turnover. The other team's capitalizing. So I think you can look at those grade A chances and... I don't know. I, I think I can chalk it up as a, a wave of bad luck, right? You, you're not going to have yeah. opponents capitalize on every, every single bad turnover. Yeah. It just seems like that's the stretch they're going for. And that's that's you've seen that a couple times, right? Nathan McKinnon last night on Altitude was asked about his home versus away from years past, and he's like, I don't know. It, it's not something I can really answer. Last year, I seemed to be better at, at, on the road. This year, I seem to be better at home. So they're just kind of those things that just – happen in yeah. hockey right I mean even I look at last night's interview with you and Nathan McKinnon and after scoring four goals he still says I don't even think that was one of my best games I've had better games where I didn't score any goals right and that, yeah. that, that's just the way hockey goes sometimes there's just things that plop their ugly faces when you don't want them and vice versa sometimes you you have a, a stroke of luck when necessarily you don't deserve it so uh, I I want to chalk it up as just a weird stretch Ugly turnovers, grade A chances given up. I think it's something they are still gonna be okay and figure it out. It's still December, as yeah. long as they're they're buzzing. But and here's the other thing: I think we can all be pretty confident that the team 
that heads into the playoffs for the Colorado Avalanche looks a lot different than the team you're seeing right now. There's yeah. still pieces to be moved. There's still guys to come in. So I think as long as they start, I don't know, cleaning so, up some areas, you, I think they'll you, be fine. You've got to clean because I, I agree with you that I do think there is an element of it that is, yeah. <laughs> You and I even made the comment a couple weeks ago. We're like, so so every mistake is going to go in the back of the net. Any mistake they make is going in? Right. Okay, cool. Because, I mean, I, I, both Chicago and then last night against Ottawa, at one point they are triple, quadrupling up the opponent in shots, and it's 2-2. Two to two. Mm-hmm. And you just can't have that. And, and, and you know, that that's not always on your goaltender. I do think that part of it is, truthfully, I think it, it all kind of ties back to what we were talking about, and it's it's that they're playing really well, they're buzzing, and then there's a breakdown in the system, and it's not that they're giving up, you know, they're making mistakes, giving up opportunities. It's like you said, they're egregious mistakes, giving up grade A opportunities, two-on-ones, breakaways, turnovers right in front of the net. I'm with you. You clean up that stuff, even just a little bit, and get marginally better at it. Okay, now we're still making mistakes and we're giving up two-on-ones, but we've cleaned up the bad turnovers in front of the net. Make those small steps, and yeah, you're you're going to see the results really start to follow because that's what feels like it's killing them. Uh, here's a fun one, I guess, and, and um, this is going to be an assist from our mutual friend Penguin Doodle. But, you know, for a while there, out. there was a conversation we were having about the final minute of the periods, yeah. right? Well, she put together all the stats she's been keeping track and, and has let me know. So nine games, 11 goals in the final 60 seconds. 13 goals if you jump to the final 90 seconds of a period. Wow. So I think that right there, I know we've talked about what do you got to do to clean that up, and we just get, oh, you got to bear down. But if they can clean that specific yeah, thing yeah, up yeah. alone, they're going to be in such better shape than they are right now. Well, and, you know, it's it's funny because, you know, they, they say, like you, you just mentioned, they've used the phrase, you got to bear down. And, and what I, I think that means is, like, you can't take your foot off the gas in the last minute. And it almost feels like that's a little bit what they've done, where you know they have these really strong, you know, nineteen minute periods, and then like, oh, nice, good period, guys, nice job, yeah, cool. The full oh, sixty, man, the right. full sixty, yeah. and this is something I've been saying for two seasons now. I heard it come out of Jared Bednar's mouth on the radio the other day. They have always struggled to put a full 60 together and I don't know what it is about them. They either get leads and they feel good, or they get down and they feel down. But yeah, I. I've, I rarely see a full 60 out of this squad. Um, Yeah. I am one of those, like, not to be that good. But, like, I think it's hard for any team to play at the highest level they can for 60 full minutes. Um, But I don't think it's impossible to go 60 minutes without having bad mistakes. Mm Mm-hmm. So, I guess looking at Devontae still, do you feel like he's maybe – wave riding a little bit, right? We were talking about how I tend to <laughs> ride those waves. No, no. Is everything as bad as Devontae's his facial expression was making it seem in that video? Um, No. And I think he even mentioned that in the interview. Like, they're still sitting in fine position. And I, I mentioned that after the game. Did that Was that loss bad? Yeah, that was a bad loss. Yeah, that's that's a really bad loss to have to a, a really bad team that was depleted. Um. I I said after the game, that's the kind of loss that has to lead to some type of change. Not not you know trading or firing anybody, but like in the way that you're playing, in the way that you're bought in, the way that you're committed, something's got to change there. But at the end of the day, man, that win last night pulls him back into a tie for first in the central. They're comfortable. I mean, they're they're I believe double digit, 13, 14 points in a playoff spot. Like, they're fine. The other thing, too, that I, gosh, not to be, you know, way overly optimistic, but what this should be showing people is this is a really good team. This is a very talented team. They're not playing well by their own admission. We're not playing to the standard that we have set. Jared Bednar is angry last night after that game because of the way the second period looked. And they're tied for first in the central. To your point, if they make any more moves, bring anyone else in, you know you've got Lekkinen coming back. You know you've got Kovalenko coming over. 
if if they can get some of that stuff cleaned up, everyone's takeaway should be, uh oh, yikes! If they find a way to get this cleaned up, yikes, mm-hmm. bro! Because they're 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 in it. They're right at the top of the league, and everybody like unanimously agrees. What's wrong with the abs? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just. And I think Devon Taves the other night, I think that was, like you said off the top of the show, that was kind of a breaking point. We've talked about this. We've tried to say the right things. We've tried to stay positive. We've tried to, you know, address this internally. We've tried to, you know, whatever. Fine. If you guys don't want to do it, one, that's the results we're going to get. And two, if you don't want to listen to me, I'll say it to them and I'll let Hockey Night in Canada talk about it. I'll let Sportsnet dissect it for the next three days if you guys don't want to listen to us. And I'll let everyone out there speculate who the six guys are that I'm that's talking about. That's where I was about. going to next because that's exactly what he said. We got six guys not playing. The 14 guys are and I don't know. It's it's really hard to not feel like Ryan Johansson is you're, included in you're those like six the guys. You're like the 11th person to say that to me about Ryan Johansson. And I feel bad for, for Ryan Johansson because apparently everyone just thinks that he's... Yeah, he just... It, it's, it's, so, I feel bad for him too because oh, I, I like I, him. He's a nice guy, but it seems like everywhere you look, he just somebody's making a comment about something negative that he's doing. And of course, um, that we don't know that, that Ryan Johansson is part of those six 100%. guys. And, and my other thing too is, I, I don't, I don't know how accurate of a number that was. I don't know if he was just saying, sure. you know, it's like we've got four, you know, we got fourteen guys out there, or if that was like an actual, I'm calling out the six guys, and the six guys know who they are. You know, I, I just don't know. Um, and then you know, he he kind of made the point immediately after. He said it doesn't take a lot. For this to go, you know, for it to not work on the ice. So again, I don't know if six was just like a representative number or if there is an actual number six individuals who know who they are. And when they listen to this, they know I'm talking about them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I'm not going to speculate on that. I mean, Jared Bednar loves the simple game, right? He just wants hard work and keep it simple. So I can see that. I can see how maybe some of the new guys are not used to such a simplified game, maybe trying to do a little bit too much, whether it's with the energy or with puck handling or fancy passing. So that's one of the things that the comments from Jared Bednar that I mentioned earlier, that's one of the things he said. Guys want to do more, mm-hmm. and I know they can do more. I need them to do what we're asking them to do. And and I'm paraphrasing a little bit. I don't remember exactly what his quote was, but he mentioned, you know, it's it's not even about teaching guys what to do. It's about teaching guys what not to do. And I know they think that they can be a first-line winger. And I'm sure they could be. I need you to be the best third-line winger that you can be, that that is in the league. That's what we need from you to win. And I think that's a hard thing to buy into. And I think you've got to really, really, really believe in the people around you, in the process and and I I think that's something that takes time. You know, I'm not trying to excuse it, but I I for me I think you've got a faction of guys who are in this locker room who have been here, who understand the culture, understand what it takes to to get there. And then I think you do have a new group of guys who are coming in that, you know, a guy like Ross Colton gets it. He has a ring, um, and I think they all want to win. But I think they're all good hockey players, and they're all saying, yeah, but I know how to be a good hockey player. And I always go back to the interview that Nathan McKinnon did the summer of 2022. He was back in Nova Scotia somewhere, and he did a podcast with someone there. And he said, you know, we were all laughing at one of the, someone's cup party. So we were all sitting around, smoking cigars, whatever, and we were reminiscing on a couple of the years prior where we had, you know, won a round. And, you know, we would all be sitting there the night before a game saying, guys, this is the year. We're doing it. This is the year. And then he said, and then after having gone through it and un- now understanding what it takes and what the grind was mentally, physically, he goes, I look back and it's so obvious. None of those were the year. We weren't even close. Like we were nowhere near ready. And I think you've got some guys going through that. Eric Lacroix made, made the point on his show the other day, talking about like a championship mentality is every day. You have, to, you have to wake up and, and, and 
fuel your body, the championship mentality. You got to go to the practice facility and work out before practice with a championship mentality. Then you got to practice with a championship mentality. Then you got to do your cool down after with a championship mentality. Your recovery, all of that. Then you got to you got to you know eat like a champion. You, like you, it's all of it to get there because you know like you and I followed that cup run up to the bitter end. We're in the building, the bitter end, and like they're wheeling Val Nachushkin out of there on a flatbed. But like that's what it takes. And I think you've got a group of guys who, while they're very good players and they've been in the league and they've been around and some of them have had some success, I think it's hard to integrate into that and it's hard to get that unless you've done it. And that's why for guys like Devon Taves and Nathan McKinnon, it's like, yeah, obviously this is what it takes. Let's go. And it's just not quite there yet. Yeah, and for some of these guys, they've been playing a certain style their whole lives, right? Mm-hmm. And I don't want to pick on – I'm going to pick on some of the new guys just in case they are one of the six people, right? Like, let's look at Jonathan Druin, for example. Such great vision, amazing hands, can really do almost anything he wants with the puck. But that could pay, maybe lead to a little overconfidence near the blue line where you don't want to be mm-hmm. turning it over and perhaps he turns it over. Or rather than just getting it deep, letting somebody go dig it out, he's trying to make a fancy pass. Let's look at Miles Wood. Such a north-south mentality, right? Mm-hmm. I just want to go and hit somebody and I'm just going to go get that puck. But in doing so, you maybe miss some of the details of just maybe slowing down, checking the game around you a little bit. We can go on and on and see, you know, whose who's strengths, whose weaknesses, and what have you. But I think there's something to exactly what you're saying. Look at Jonathan Duran's game in the last okay let's, month. Yeah, last month or so. He's really found his fit. It seems mm-hmm. like maybe it's clicking a little bit. Okay, these are the things I need to do, and he's seeing the success. Yeah, well, so I think, I think he's a great name to pick because I, I – I think it was you who just talked to Nathan McKinnon a few nights ago. I think it was after the Sharks game about Drew N. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he mentioned it was about a month ago he stopped thinking and he stopped worrying about making a mistake and he stopped being afraid to, you know, do something wrong. And to me, that that right there sounds like John him getting through to Jonathan Drew and like if you play the way that we play, it's okay if you make a mistake because we're gonna back you up and we're gonna have we, we got you. It's not gonna burn us. If you're playing with the collective, mm-hmm. that's the beauty of the system is it allows for kind of, you know, creative risks because if the system is functioning correctly, you've got, you've always got someone filling in, backing you up that, that you know, if you turn the puck over, they're going to be there to bail you out. That was what, you know, was so striking about, especially the, the Kale and uh, Devon pairing over these last couple of years is it felt like you couldn't make a mistake with them on the ice. They were always in the right spot. And I, to me, what we're seeing out of Jonathan Druin, I believe, is the buy-in and the belief of, okay, if I do this, not only is it going to come for me and I'm going to get my points, but it's going to lead to overall production, fewer mistakes on the ice for more or for less goals against, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And he hasn't been perfect, but I think you're starting to see that you know, come through in his game, and you hope that maybe that leads to the other guys believing a little bit. Can't also have this conversation without connecting the dots of Tomas Tatar. That's exactly where my mind was going too, because I know I talked about it on this very podcast. The time we were in the locker room after a practice session, and he's just kind of staring off into space, like trying to envision what he was supposed to do and where, right? Yeah. It just showed me, okay, there, there's a lot more complexity to this structure than meets the eye. Mm-hmm. There's a lot more that that's harder for some players to grasp than just simply go out and play hockey, right? Yep. It's just simply, it's just simply, and here we were talking about how much Jared Bednar likes to simplify, but there, there there's complexities to it. So well, it's just not something that everybody fits into simply. And, dude, I'm sure you've heard this phrase, but, you know, hockey coaches love this. Hockey, be- organized chaos. Mm-hmm. To your point, you watch hockey out there, and it looks like, well, it's so fluid and random. Doing. But, like, everything out there, at the pro level at least, is very calculated. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, like, Devon Taves making the comment of it's hard to play this game when you don't know where your teammate's going to mm-hmm. be. Like, again, at face value, that's like a, how could you possibly know where they're going to be? 
but these systems are built so that when the puck goes here, you're going there. When you're coming here, you fill in, and then you 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 know you jump into this spot, and that guy circles back around, and hey, now this lane is open because they you know he was kind of a D, and it's all very very intentional if it's functioning as it's supposed to. Everybody's got to be on the same page. Everybody's got to be on the same page. Did you watch the Druen morning skate interview that I did with him yesterday? I don't believe I did. I asked him about yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Nate. Yeah. And dude, it was yeah, yeah. fascinating. Because I just I, I I wanted to <laughs> it took me a second. I was like, I thought you said you didn't see it. Uh I asked him about Nate. Cause and I told him, I know we asked you all about this before. And if you were excited, now that you've been back playing with him, you've gotten some reps on a line with him, how has it been? Like, is it kind of what you know what you remember? And dude, he goes, you know, he goes, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I, you know, I, I know where he is out there, and you know, he goes, we, you know, we just got great chemistry, and, and then he kind of stops and goes, I, I can almost kind of like feel him out there. It's weird. And then he like went back into his answer, but like his tone changed, his cadence changed when he said, I, I can almost like feel him out there. It's weird. And I just thought that that was a really because people used to talk about that with Sedin's. Um, I there, there was a guy that I grew up playing with, Zach Robb, that I always remember having a little bit of that I was like, I'm sure Zach is right there. And you throw it there and, you know, that's where they are. But I just thought that was an interesting thing for him to say. And, and it almost kind of like broke his train of thought. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. I can almost kind of feel him out there. It's weird. And then he, you know, kept going with the answer. Uh, but like I thought that little touch pass he had with him last night was not like a great example of like the no look thing, but just knowing like I know he's ready for this puck to come right back to him. Mm-hmm. And um, I just I, I think Jonathan Drouin's been an absolute pleasure to be around this year, and 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 it makes me excited to see him having some success, you know, as an individual because uh, I, I think he's been great to have around. Agreed, one hundred percent. Let's shift away from I guess the negativity. It is the Christmas spirit, after all. We don't want to be the Scrooges of podcast world. Yep. The power play is looking fantastic right now. If yeah. there's anything that's really going full steam, I feel like it's the power play. Mm-hmm. But that leads some people to question, what about the five-on-five? Five? They got to score five-on-five five goals to win in the playoffs, blah, blah, blah. I tell those people, chill out. <laughs> Why do I tell those people chill out? Because they're actually fourth in the NHL in five-on-five five goals. So, Wow, it's crazy. It's almost like this is an elite cup contending team. Right. You, you think, oh, man, this this five. And we've heard a lot from even some of the players, some of Coach Bednar, that we're having some players having a hard time five on five. The team as a whole, and I know this has a lot to do with the top yeah. line and Nathan McKinnon, but they're still in they're great team, shape right? at five on five. Well, that, that also coincidentally tied for fourth in uh, in the power play. Um, or tied for second with three other teams, sorry, uh, which could have been fourth. One, two, three, four. If that makes sense. <laughs> what uh, makes me laugh, you know, about what you just said, that, you know, there's going to be people out there be like, well, the five on five. Go back 10 days. Conversation's like, this team can only score at five on five. <laughs> there's no, their power play's terrible. Um, Yeah, man, you know, this is, I, I really do. I, 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 I think this is an elite cup contending team. Um, that that's finding their way a bit right now with a lot of changeover in the summer. Uh, and then as you and I have pointed out, this is an odd year for the NHL, man. Everybody is, there's a really tight pack right in the middle of the league. Um, and so I'm not at all surprised by what you're saying. The power play looks fantastic right now. That the, the, the McKinnon goal, the give and go with drew in, I mean, that's that's an all-world power play. That puck didn't stop moving. They were snapping it around the perimeter, through you know, through the seam, across the slot, into the bumper spot, back out, shots on goal, puck retrieval, uh, and then, you know, great little give-and-go, one-timer, and uh, that's it, man. Val Nachushkin, Miko Rantanen, Nathan McKinnon, backed by Kale McCarr and Devon Taves at 5-on-5 five five is already unfair. Yeah, 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 yeah. When they get the, the man advantage, swap out Devon Taves for Jonathan Drouin, and you you have a, just such a dynamic five. They're so skilled, so on the same page. Don't need to tell you guys anything you don't know. This power play is just something I could watch all day long. Well, well and it's, it's why it's frustrating when it's not clicking because the players that are out there are so elite that 
when it's not going, you're like, what the hell? <laughs> With that, Nathan McKinnon adding his 300th you, goal of his career. Can you name that reference? No. No. It's that old shoes video. Do you remember that? The old, like old, vi- like original viral video shoes. No. You don't remember that? No. I just I don't guy. I don't keep up with that stuff. I, I, I mean, this is from like 2004. I've never been like super. I, I don't mean, keep up with this stuff. It's I like almost hockey. 20. It's more than 20 years. Almost 20 years old. Almost 20 years old. Well, send it to my send it my way. You didn't know what uh, Cardi B rant I was talking about last year. That's that's so, last year. That's <laughs> last so week, different. You didn't see that Cardi B tweet <laughs> as opposed to one of the original like viral videos on YouTube. <laughs> um, the let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah, Nathan McKinnon's 300 goals. Yeah. Um, he was pissed after the game. He he was pissed that wow. he should have had three hundred sooner. He had he had such a <laughs> slow start. This is, this is you can all you can, you can go listen to the interview. He goes, yeah, nope, slow start to my career. Should have had it way sooner. And we were like, Ugh. I think Bolding asked him about it. Let's just look at the recent streak. Right, he's on a seventeen game point streak. Last time he had a zero. In a game was actually still a win. They won in Dallas in November. Mm-hmm. Since that big he's, win, he's had 12, 12 goals and twenty one assists. Yeah, he's an animal, dude. I mean, he's he's operating at an insane pace right now. He's at fifty three points total in thirty three games played. I mean, I mean, un- unstoppable last night. Only dude. six times has he had a zero in a game. Unstoppable last night. All my betters out there, listen to that again. Well, then- only six times has he had a zero. <laughs> well, then. I believe it was you two episodes ago being like, I don't know what's wrong with this dude. He just doesn't look like himself. You and your boy Arif. Yeah, he did. And then he woke up and went on a 17-point streak, 17-game point streak. This guy. He woke up. This guy. Uh, no, dude, I mean, he was incredible last night. That that was a performance of – that was a Thanos performance. Fine, I'll do it myself. Which is what he's had to do lately, which he's done last season, which we've seen him do a lot of times in his career. Um, and that's you know that's what makes him as special of a player as he is, as, as special as Kale McCarr is, and and Nate kind of defers to Kale when you talk about them, you know, like he's the better player, and, and Kale might be, but I mean like this is the game break ability that Nathan McKinnon has. Um, uh, you know, during this streak, he had those back to back games with huge hits. He's so responsible defensively. He, he's he's a way better defensive one-on-one player than people realize. He's strong. He's physical. He goes to the net. Um, I really do, man. Obviously, Connor McDavid is an unbelievable, un, almost unbelievable player on some nights. You watch some of the things he does. To me, I have always made the argument that what – I really do truly think puts Nathan McKinnon in the conversation for the best player in the world on any given night is his commitment to do things away from the offensive zone that are just as special. His commitment to the full 200-foot game changed a few years ago, and it's it's what makes him so special. I, 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 I do stand by my take of I do think Kale McCarr is the best player in the world because of his impact from goal line to goal line is, I think, just exceeds that of anybody else. But it's what we're seeing out of Nathan McKinnon in these 17 games, the defensive commitment, the physical play, and the insane production. That's what separates him from Austin Matthews, Kale McCarr, definitely a guy like Leon Dreisaitl. Um, I have know. a couple things to respond to, okay. so give me a second here. First of all, all right, guys, that's one second. Time's up. <laughs> hey, everybody, I, I, fast forward a couple minutes if you don't want to hear my terrible. No, oh, don't fast forward. Slow it down, actually. Listen to this in slow mo. Uh, Nathan McKinnon, last week we were talking to him after the Calgary game, and Ryan Bowling had a, had a good little back and forth with him. <laughs> and Nathan McKinnon talked about how he's been doing stuff off ice that nobody sees that really helps him. Ryan Bolding goes, what are those things? Mm -hmm. Without hesitation. I think Nathan McKinnon even cut him off a little bit. Cut him off and said, I'm not telling you. I'm not talking about it. I'm not talking about it. Yeah. He's got a secret weapon. He doesn't want anybody to know about it. He's like, if if anybody else in the NHL finds out that I'm doing this, everybody's going to be as good as me. (laughs) I'm so curious what the the secret weapon is. Dude, I mean, I I do just, I, I think Nathan McKinnon has a commitment level that I don't think the 
general public quite understands. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think that he's on like a pretty different level with the commitment that he makes to in season, especially. I mean, like I know when all that stuff with Zadorov, you know, came out a few years ago, and that story kind of unfolded a little bit. Nate actually even did an interview that summer about it. Like he said, he has someone that I think used to live in with him, and now he has his own place. But that after games, the guy would meet him at his house and they would do a full workout training, recovery, and nutrition session. And he was like, ah, my adrenaline's going. I can't go to sleep anyways. So I might as well get in a harder workout than you've ever done in your life <laughs> at 1 a.m. after I played an NHL game. And, and, it, and I think he's probably just like building on that. Arif tweeted it out last night. And I know, you know, credit to Arif, he's been keeping an eye on this since the summer. I know this for a fact. But in the calendar year, so January 1st to January 1st, there is no better hockey player yeah. in the NHL than Nathan McKinnon. So to your point, he just has those extra little intangibles that mm -hmm. probably do put him above guys like Connor McDavid, Leon Dreisaitl. He's just a coach's wet dream, right? I mean, everything he does is exactly what you want. Hey, I, I have a young baby. Mm -hmm. I can't wait for him to play hockey, and I can't wait for him to say, that's how you do it. Mm -hmm. That's how you prepare. That's how you approach the game. This is exactly the epitome of a great hockey well, player. Well, and as much as we can even, you know, hum and haw about the way he is in the locker room, and, you know, last night, huge four goals, five points, 300th goal in his career, and he, like, couldn't be more annoyed to be talking to everybody about it. But I, I think that's just part of what makes him who he is. And that's part of what makes him such an elite level player. I, I've said it before on this pod. I've said it, he's the most intense person I've ever met in my life. Mm -hmm. And that, not in a bad way. But like he's just, I think you said it this one time on the pod. When, when you're interviewing him, he expects like the same out of you as he expects out of himself and his teammates. Like, are you prepared to be in here talking mm -hmm. and asking questions? And, and like that's why when people ask dumb, silly questions, he gives them dumb, silly answers because it's like, what did you expect? Yeah. And that's just who he is. Um, and, and I think that's part of what makes him the player he is, is that just like insatiable hunger to be the best. He did the, the interview with um, 32 Thoughts the summer after they won the Cup, and they said – how do you feel? And he goes, I thought it'd feel more satisfying. <laughs> that cracks me up. And it's just like... He cracks me up. Like, I love his mentality. I love his energy. I, I, I get joy out of it because I love how intense he is. I like to think of myself as having a small little bone similar to what he does. Mm -hmm. Very, very small. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's like I bumped into him and like whatever he like residually left on me is like, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I got that intensity. Yeah. Now I expect the best out of everybody around me too, right? <laughs> yeah. um, no, but I, I'm with you. I, the other thing I wanted to comment on on your little rant was the Kale McCarr part because I'm 100% with you. Kale McCarr, in my opinion, is the best hockey player on the planet. Yep. Nathan McKinnon is so good and so fantastic but doesn't quite have the impact that Kale McCarr had. We've seen centers that are amazing, that can fly like Nathan McKinnon. We've never seen a Kale McCarr. Mm -hmm. And the way Kale McCarr can affect a game, I think, is everything to this team. Mm -hmm. Having Kale McCarr out there, they, you know they love the the minutes. They put Kale McCarr out there as much as they possibly can. Why is that? Because he's so damn good. Mm -hmm. You want to win a hockey game, you put Kale McCarr out there. So seeing his injury and seeing how he's a... Ah, I don't want to say forcing himself to play, but obviously just not 100%. He's told us that a couple mm -hmm. times this year. Just shows you, okay, you saw him out of the lineup a couple times, Avalanche struggle. You see him in the lineup, and the Avalanche come back, and uh, after having maybe the worst second period they've had all year <laughs> and had all the confidence in the world that they were going to get it done, it's because Kale McCarr's on the ice facilitating. So Kale McCarr gets O-zone starts, gets D-zone starts. If you're down by one late in a game, he's on the ice. If you're up by one late in a game, he's on the ice. Plays power play. Plays if, penalty if, kill. If you're on a power play, he's your quarterback. If you're killing penalties, five on four or five on three, he's out there. He's a one-man breakout machine. He's also a one-man zone entry machine. He gets shots on goal every game, and then his production level is crazy. 
He blocks shots. Like, there, there's nothing that he doesn't do, and he does all of it at an elite level. All of it. All of it. He's Always. An, he's an elite defender. He's an elite offensive defenseman. He's an elite penalty killer. He's an elite power play quarterback. He's, he, he can be a shutdown defenseman. He can be a north-south defenseman. Uh, he, he, he can play with anybody. Like, he's... There, there is, in my opinion, no other player in the league that can do what Kale McCarr does. Yeah, agreed. Agreed. And, and I think a lot of people worry about his time on ice. I did my stats homework for this show. He's actually go. 20th. Really? In the league in time on ice. Tied to the second with Devon Taves. Interesting. That's so funny. Um, and then, I don't know, I, people talk a lot about his health. What I actually appreciate about Kale McCarr is that I feel like he misses small chunks of games. Two here, three there, one here, four there, two here. And you get to the end of the season, you're like, yeah, you played 65 games, you're fine with that. Mm-hmm. 65 to 70, it's whatever. And I think he does a lot of that looking out for like, I don't want to end up with the injury that I now miss 15 games. Mm-hmm. So I don't know, just my two two cents. Yeah, just the other side of that coin is, what's this guy look like when he is finally feeling 100%? Because we know he hasn't been 100% for a very long time. If if and when they can get him back to 100%, whew, look at that world. Um, sticking with that, good to see Sam Gerard back on the ice. Yeah, dude, fantastic. Fantastic to see him back out there. Saw him after the game last night, you know, what's up, Sam? You know, blah, blah, blah. And, um. That's good, man. It's 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 really good to see him back out there, and and all the guys were excited to see him, and and all of that. And um, Sam Gerard's been here for so long, we forget how old he is. Mm-hmm. He's only twenty five years old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looking at myself when I was twenty five, I would have had a hard time being in the NHL as well. Yeah. Um. So I I cut him a little bit of slack there. Good to see him kind of you know get back to it so quickly. Right? Mm-hmm. I thought at first maybe this was going to be a season-long thing that they're dealing oh, wow, with. Really? Interesting. Very brief, which I thought was a, a good thing. And, again, let's throw some more stats out there. In my mind, I was thinking about the conversation we had about Ryan Johansson, right? And it's like, man, he seems to kind of be everybody's scapegoat mm-hmm. at times. Mm-hmm. And then I looked back at the conversation I had with Jared Bednar way early in the season when I asked him, where does Ryan Johansson rank for you as far as players that you've coached at the faceoff dot? Because mm-hmm. the statistic answer is he's the best one I've ever had. <laughs> the actual answer I got from Jared Bednar was, oh, he's up there. So to tie it into Sam Gerrard, Sam Gerrard actually has a faceoff in his career. He does, and yeah. he won it. He's 100%. <laughs> so Sam Gerrard might be one of the best faceoff guys Jared Bednar's ever coached. Ryan Johansson's. He's up there. Number two. Yeah. I, was, I just thought that was I love that. Though. Thanks. I, I, I do always love, uh, I think Nikita Zadorov has a face-off as well. Yeah, that, uh, John Michael Lyles has one. It's, yeah. it's funny to check the list of yeah. random people that have face-offs for the abs. Yeah. Um, yeah, last thing before we get out of here, Jess, we got to look ahead at the Coyotes. Of course, last time the two teams met, mm-hmm. the Coyotes won in overtime. Yep. They face off Saturday night before we yep. head into you the got- Christmas break. It's a big one because... It's divisional, right? And I I go back to that game in Winnipeg, and I still am kind of scratching my head as to why Jared Bednar decided to go with Ivan Prozvatov Mm -hmm. because that was a big Central Division match, and they lost it, and important points slip slip away just for you to go and beat down the San Jose Sharks the next night. I'm hoping they approach this game a little bit more soundly, seriously, because Arizona, Nashville, they're nipping at your heels. So they're not as far behind as you think. Exactly. Um, Two straight games against the Coyotes. 23rd and 27th. Um, yeah, you said these are divisional games. If, if you lose these straight up, that, that's a big swing. And suddenly Arizona is, you know, you still got a little bit of a cushion there, but like they're in it. If they lose Saturday night, Arizona's four points behind them. If they lose two in a row, it's only two points. Right. I don't think that's going to happen. I have zero doubt in my mind the Avalanche take care of business against the Arizona Coyotes, but – they got to make sure to take care of business. Well, but, but, so this is one of those ones where, okay, you didn't take care of business against the Hawks. Get your pound of flesh back here. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you had to you had to pull it together at the last second last night. 
Go get your good win here. And as we mentioned, Nathan McKinnon doesn't know why, but they have been really good at home this year so far. Well, in these games against the Yotes, man, we've talked about it. Th- these games get everybody on the ice up for whatever reason about these two teams. It's They don't like each other, so I expect some intense games. I think it's going to be a fun crowd tomorrow, too. Yeah. Last game before the holiday break. You're right. Dude, driving here today, like you can tell everybody's... Everybody's at the mall. Everyone's at the mall. Everyone's <laughs> at the airport. Uh, nobody's on the roads. I think tomorrow's gonna, tomorrow night's going to be a fun one. Got to be courteous if you're at the airport and at the mall. Just be courteous everywhere. And, dude, just be aware of your surroundings. My mm-hmm. goodness, the amount of people that just wander through the airport like they are the only ones in there. It's crazy. Mm-hmm. And last thing for me, enjoy the holiday season. Love your loved ones. Mm-hmm. And take care of yourself. This week I lost my cat, my godmother, Oh my gosh. And a friend, all three of which to cancer. So Jesse, when I'm hard on you about those things you're eating, yeah. I come from a place of care. So make sure you're taking care of yourselves. Enjoy every moment you have with everybody because you never know what the future holds. JJ, I, uh, I, I, well, I, now I feel bad because I'm doing this on the show. But I'm very sorry, man. I, I only knew about uh, one of those. I didn't know uh, everything that was going on for you. So I, I'm very much, uh, I'll be thinking about you. Um I mean, I'm always thinking about you. Um, but like you said, especially this time of year, man, you know, it's, uh, this is, this is a, um, it, it's, it's a special time of year. Cause it, it you know, it kind of forces you to think about people that are close to you and, and, you know, spending time with, with, uh, loved ones and stuff like that. So, uh, you're hundred percent right. And, uh, like I said, I, I love you, man. I'm sorry you're going through all that. And, um, but hopefully these next few days can. Lift your spirits a bit. Yeah, it's a baby's first Christmas, so we got to go. try to approach it as so. So thanks, everybody, for hanging out with us. Thanks for my little heartwarming moment. I never really do anything like that <laughs> on a podcast. I really try to stay very um, task at hand. Yep. So, uh, yeah, thanks for hanging out with us. Have a Merry Christmas, everybody, and we'll be back next week for more Avalanche conversation. So Woo. for Jesse, I'm JJ. This has been Gorilla Hockey. Merry Christmas.